Is Charles Schwab stock, SCHW, in trouble? Now, this video is not to say, oh my goodness, the sky is falling, you know, like get your money out. That's not what I'm saying in this video. What I am doing is let's let's have a little analogy. If you had a business that had a long-term track record that was very attractive, had otherwise very attractive economics today, but also had 50% of their revenue tied to a business line that you were unclear whether or not it would truly exist in the next year or two, would you say, hey, this is a promising business, 50, roughly 50% of their business, 50% of their revenue. In this analogy, you would say, wait a second, you know, I, I would want to go through line by line, understand what's going on with revenue and understand, you know, if 50% if could be challenged, maybe that's something that investors should be aware of. So I'd argue that's the case that investors should think about with Charles Schwab stock. And let's let's go through their latest results. Let's go through to understand what's going on with Charles Schwab, because when you look at their results in the most recent quarter, clients continue to love and trust the platform. This is undeniable. During the quarter, client assets reached $9.1 trillion, up 20% year over year, record figure. In the, four, in the first quarter alone, they had $96 billion in core net new assets, $45 billion in March alone. Clients love Charles Schwab. Not surprising, the stock ripped higher you know, during the trading hours today, up a couple percent following these results. But let's dive in. Let's understand these results because it's a little surprising to see a little bump up when you actually dig into the fundamentals. And that's the whole basis of this channel. When you're watching Unrivaled Investing, it's supposed to be educational and help you think about investing. And so if you enjoy educational investment videos, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. So let's look at what's actually going on with Charles Schwab. Because when you look at their results, you see sales decline by 7% not great. You see earnings decline somewhere between 17% and 20%. Not really promising. Now, other investors might say, well, Daniel, you're missing the bigger picture. Long term, the return on equity for this business is very attractive, somewhere between, let's say, 15 and 40% profit margins or 15 to 40% return on equity. So long term, as long as the underlying business doesn't isn't fundamentally challenged and can stay stable, then you can get very attractive return on equity should should command a premium. That's the thought from the bulls. Now, let's actually dig into these results. You know, how do you eat an elephant? You eat an elephant by biting one bite at a time you know, one forkful at a time. Not, not a particularly appealing image to think of. But, you know, thinking about the, the implication for Charles Schwab, you go through one line item at a time to understand what's going on. And if you look at just these three line items, which is net interest revenue, asset management and admin fees and trading revenue, this adds up to over 90 percent of Charles Schwab's revenue. So just understanding these three helps you understand the story. Now, net interest revenue, that's going to be sort of the heart of the story here. And this is nearly 50 percent of their sales, around 47 percent. Trading revenue, I'm not going to talk much about. Trading revenue is around $800 million out of nearly $5 billion in revenue. And this, arguably, it's, it's tough to see a lot of growth in this over time in terms of trading revenue because the whole trend over several decades, several decades ago, you'd call your broker up and they'd charge you hundreds of dollars on a, in, you know, a, in terms of commissions. Now, the costs have dropped significantly, um, yeah, Largely because there's been a technological revolution. Uh, you you see, you know, com brokerages that are offering zero percent commission. So when you have that type of dynamic, that type of environment, it's very difficult to see trading revenue as a revenue driver go up significantly in the future. There's sort of a ceiling in terms of how much you can charge, and over time, that's going to continue to to sort of limit the growth in that segment. But interest revenue, which represents nearly fifty percent of their revenue. Let's understand this piece because that's that's a big piece. And the way to think about it is clients keep their money in their account. They sometimes have some cash. That cash can get swept into the Charles Schwab bank. So this is not Charles Schwab money markets or various different products where they have fees, but it can go into the Charles Schwab bank. And the Charles Schwab bank uh, will then take this, you know, three nearly $300 billion and then reinvest it across various different assets. You have available for sale securities. You have held to maturity securities. Some of this might sound familiar, 
because uh, I previously talked about Charles Schwab and I talked about the banking crisis last year uh, with Silicon Valley Bank, which got caught up. And Charles Schwab arguably did not do a great job. And I'll show you why, like pinpoint exactly why they got caught up in a problem in just a second, which is they several banks said, hey, I'm not getting an adequate I, I'm I'm not able to get an adequate yield holding cash. So let me hold super long dated bonds and I'm going to buy these long dated bonds. And that's the way I'm going to get a slightly juicier return. Now, some investors, some platform said, no, I'm not going to make that trade off. Fairfax, one of my largest holdings said, hey, I'm not going to make that trade off. I'm just going to sit on cash. And when, when I have an appropriate interest yield, then I'll buy long, longer term bonds. But if, if the yield's not there, I'm not going to reach. Charles Schwab reached. And you can see that with how they are available for sales securities and held to maturity securities, you know, roughly, let's say $270 billion, nearly the same amount as their bank deposits, are stuck in assets only yielding around 2%. So this is a real challenge because the client deposits are yielding around 1% and rapidly shrinking down year over year from $343 billion to $274 billion. Partly because investors are saying, well, wait a second. I can hold cash, you know, at another platform like Interactive Brokers, which is where I personally keep my funds, get 4.8% versus Charles Schwab holding it in their, their bank account, the Charles Schwab bank, and get 1%. Okay, so that's that's a challenge. So the, arguably, they deserve to lose that business, which is then making a spread on a suboptimal portfolio of bonds yielding 2%. This gets further challenged because if they were forced to if if let's say that 270 billion dollars were to say hey i don't want to keep my funds here getting one percent maybe i just want to even move it to a charles schwab product yielding something higher so it doesn't even need to leave the bank it just needs to it, it doesn't even need to leave charles schwab the platform it just needs to go from the it just goes from charles schwab the bank to a different product in that situation, they would be forced to recognize losses that they've made from poorly, you know, poorly from their poor investments, their low yielding investments. And one example of which is how they have held to maturity securities, which represents U.S. agency mortgage backed securities, where they invested roughly one hundred sixty billion dollars and the fair value of which is one hundred forty seven billion dollars. So they have twelve billion dollars in unrealized losses. That's not yet on their balance sheet. This was as of the fourth quarter, 2023. So I, I'm not sure if, you know, they. I, I wasn't able to see this chart updated in the most recent press release. But given that bond prices have sold off subsequently, I'd imagine that it's only gotten worse in terms of the unrealized losses in terms of this, this bond portfolio versus their tangible equity of around $14 billion. This is This is from their press release today. So you're saying, hey, around $12 billion in losses that could get fed through if customers were to you know, transfer funds from their bank, yielding only 1% to maybe a Charles Schwab money market or, or go to Interactive Brokers or something like that. And then you'd have a mega institution with close to zero adjusted equity value. So for me personally, that would make me extremely nervous looking at that. That's why I'm not an investor in Charles Schwab. But that said, the market clearly disagrees with me and is saying, look, this this business has over $100 billion in equity value. This is the market capitalization. You know, you can see, you know, the, the market capitalization has gone up dramatically over time from $40 billion to over $120 billion in terms of market cap. So investors clearly do trust it, not only with the capital that I talked about earlier that, you know, you're seeing tens of billions of dollars in capital going to their platform, but investors are trusting it with the valuation, giving it, you know, $100 billion plus valuation. You could see all these types of charts for free available at AI ticker chat. See the link below. Now, why does it have this, this valuation? Why does it have a $100 billion plus valuation? I think part of it is because investors just broadly trust it. You see news articles saying that US News says it's the best investing platform overall. And so one could you know, clearly give them credit that this is an accessible platform where people you know, find it easy to invest. And then the second key line item in terms of their revenue, I talked about interest revenue, which is roughly 40 you know, 7% of sales. Their second largest is the asset management and admin fees 
schedule. And this business is rocking and rolling up 20% year over year, largely because investors are increasingly investing in products that you know, they, they get a cut effectively, whether or not it's a money market fund or fee-based advisory solutions where you can see their average fee. And this gets to my challenge earlier, you know, about, well, wait a second, even if funds keep, even if their bank deposits were to switch to a Charles Schwab product, so not even leaving the company, you could have a real challenge there because this sort of mismatch in terms of you, you're, you're locked in with this, these assets at a 2% yield. That said, this part of the segment is growing very, very well and has done well for some time. Now, it will change with market pricing over time, but this is just a beautiful, beautiful business model, you know, where you're getting a fee off of all these different products, whether or not it's equity products or, you know, mutual funds, money markets. This is a beautiful business getting a low fee, you know, as as the the dollar values go up. They get to keep that percentage fee. And it's just, that's part of the reason why you have this $100 billion business. I think another key aspect, once again, I go to AI ticker chat. This time I go to their new feature. This is their scorecard feature, which ranks you know companies based on various different features, one of which is looking at alignment. And so looking at alignment, I think this is another reason why investors like the stock is that management seems to be aligned. I mean, you have the co-chair Charles Schwab, who the company's named after. He still owns around 6% of the company. I mean, you you still see management own a lot of shares. So it, it getting a high score of eight out of 10 seems very, you know, this is a very strong score suggesting that there's significant alignment with the shareholders, you know, in terms of the ownership here. But now what are my thoughts thinking about Charles Schwab? Uh, you know, first of all, in full disclosure, this is not financial advice. And then also quick plug recently, a premium member of the unrivaled investing community shared the following. This is a direct quote. I got introduced to the markets as a speculator during the 2020, 2021 bubble. Your content really helped me understand long-term investing. Most of the online friends I made during the bubble are still speculating. I'm trying to convince them to join your membership. The unrealized profits from, and he mentions two different companies is enough to cover 302 years of membership. That's a direct quote. So if you're looking for compelling investment ideas, come check out unrivalinvesting.com. I do also have educational courses separately. You know, if you're interested in learning how to value stocks or read financial statements, what I wanted to know when I first started working on Wall Street, both the sell side and buy side, working a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. When I think about Charles Schwab, I honestly think it's a platform that is appealing for a lot of retail investors. But for more professional investors, you know, you see the link below. I think they recognize that interactive brokers is frankly better. And that's why you see across the board with all these other sort of more professional awards, not U.S. news, but Barron's, you know, a, a platform, a, a magazine dedicated to financial you know, advisors and informing folks, you know, about financial developments, best online broker. You know, you see all these awards for interactive brokers being so much better. And the reason being is that their cost structure, they keep their cost structure very, very low. And so your commission structure that in terms of the commissions you have to pay as a customer or the margin costs are just generally much lower than what you can get within than what you can get with Schwab. So that's personally why I keep my funds at Interactive Brokers. And I, it's something to be mindful of, which is that Interactive brokers, generally, the user interface is not as appealing as something like Charles Schwab. That's why Charles Schwab has won so well. But if you if you actually can navigate the user interface, uh, the cost structure is much more favorable from a customer perspective. And so I'd argue interactive brokers deserves to win over time. But if you want the fancy office that you're going to walk into and meet some, you know, financial advisor who has his nice hair brushed and, oh my goodness, these, this beautiful glass office. Oh, I got to, I'm going to trust you with millions of dollars, Mr. Financial Advisor, even though you don't, you know, like, I, God bless, you know, but my view is um, that what, what ends up happening there is people are trusting it because it looks good. And that's part of that's part of the appeal for Charles Schwab, to be fair, is that people go, OK, I just I like these offices. I trust it uh, when in reality, there are just better platforms available, but you have to work a little bit harder for it. So I, I think about Charles Schwab 
if you annualize their most recent earnings, then it trades around like 25 times earnings, adjusted earnings, which is not a super premium for for a arguably a quality franchise. If you believe a company is going to be much, much bigger, you know, in a decade from now, 25 times, 20 times, not expensive. The challenge is, do you actually believe that they'll be much bigger in a decade from now? Clearly, they continue to win customer deposits, you know, in terms of customers. I, I shouldn't say deposits. Con customers continue to invest using their platform, but they continue to take funds out of the Charles Schwab bank. So they're pulling funds out of the Charles Schwab bank deposits. And that's the that that's what honestly puts this in the too hard pile for me because you're you're they've locked themselves in with this 2% yielding bonds uh and this bank deposits could be 50 billion dollars this could be 100 billion dollars and where are they going to really get the cash from it okay so they have cash equivalents of 33 billion dollars so if let's say 100 billion dollars walks out the door in the next year why not? Once again, when it's only yielding 1.35%, uh, they're going to be forced to sell their available for sale securities and potentially some of their held to maturity securities, depending on how much of the bank deposits, you know, leave. And, and that's not like saying, oh, this is definitely going to happen. I'm, I'm just sort of extrapolating. Well, what happened in the past year going from 343 to 274? Well, in order to stop it from dropping significantly, they started offering some interest rate. So going from 0 0.7 to 1.3. But if they, they they can't really raise this a lot more because they'll be underwater because this available for sale securities and held to maturity securities are only yielding 2% because they locked in. So it's a challenging, it's a very challenging situation. One is which they raise rates to keep the bank deposits, in which case their net revenue just absolutely plummets. Another prospect is that these clients walk out the door. I don't really, this is 50% of their sales, 47% in the most recent quarter. That's really hard to handicap thinking about like, oh, what's this going to be in three years from now? It's, it's, it's unclear to me. If you have a different view, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to get more constructive on Charles Schwab to, because I, I see the potential with investors increasingly trusting the platform, but if they don't keep their cash at the Charles Schwab bank, it could create real challenges given that nearly half their income is coming from this interest revenue. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching Unrivaled Investing. If you're looking for more compelling investment ideas, consider unrivaledinvesting.com. Thanks so much for tuning in.